Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The record in the trial of Hitt versus Schaefer and Serena, all the attorneys, the defendants, and the judges are present. Good morning, judges. Uh, before we uh, continue with the trial, I just want to give everybody a friendly reminder that uh, during my preliminary uh, instructions to you, I told you that um, I would not allow note-taking uh, in this case. Um, there's a good reason for that, at least in my experience. Uh, note-taking can be a distraction. It can prevent jurors from devoting their full attention <coughs> to matters that are being presented to you through evidence, testimony, documents, what have you. Uh, sometimes a juror can be taking notes of something that transpired in the course of this trial and in the course of making those notes miss something that the attorneys feel is important in the case. Um, so don't feel that you have to remember every single thing that goes on here. I mean, that's, that would be ideal if, if you could, but we're human beings, we're not machines. Um, there are going to be 12 of you that will be deliberating uh, on this case. And I believe that your collective memory will be sufficient. As it, usually is. So don't take offense at my instructions not to take notes. Okay? There's a reason for it. All right. Mr. Ben, are you ready? Uh, I am. All right. Please call your next witness. Anthony Amodio. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, there's a 
Wax. Judges, the uh, parties have uh, stipulated to the qualifications of Mr. Wax uh, to testify before you as an expert. Um, Mr. Wax is being presented to you as an expert in the area of real and personal property transactions and also as an expert in the area of professional responsibility. The court will accept Mr. Wack's testimony as an expert in those areas. Now, you will recall the instructions I gave you previously with regard to expert testimony. I'm going to repeat them now for you again. As a general rule, witnesses can testify only as to facts known by them. This rule ordinarily does not permit the opinion of a witness to be received as evidence. However, an exception to this rule exists in the case of an expert witness who may give his or her opinion as to any matter in which he or she is versed, which is material to the case. In legal terminology, an expert witness is a witness who has some special knowledge, skill, experience, or training that is not possessed by the ordinary juror and who thus may be able to provide assistance to the jury in understanding the evidence presented and determine the facts in this case. Now, even though the court has accepted Mr. Wax's testimony as an expert in the fields that I just recited to you, you're not bound by the expert's opinions. You should consider each opinion and give it the weight to which you deem it is entitled, whether that be great or slight, or you may reject it. In examining each opinion, you may consider the reasons given for it, if any, and you may also consider the qualifications and credibility of the expert. It is always within the special function of the jury to determine whether the facts on which the answer or testimony of an expert is based actually exist. The value or weight of the opinion of the expert is dependent upon and is no stronger than the facts on which it is based. In other words, the probative value of the opinion will depend upon whether from all of the evidence in this case you find that those facts are true. You may in fact determine from the evidence in the case that the facts that form the basis of the opinion are true, are not true, or are true in part only. And in light of such findings, you should decide what effect such determination has upon the weight to be given to the opinion of the expert. Your acceptance or rejection of the expert opinion will depend, therefore, to some extent, on your findings as to the truth of the facts relied upon. The ultimate determination of whether or not the state has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt is to be made only by you, the judges of the facts. Mr. Wax, uh, you have uh, Uh, 
uh, is constitutes real property. Anything that is not real property is personal property. What about the house that's on real property? Whatever is uh, fixed to the real property goes along with the real property in connection with the sale. But I have had situations where the house or the building has been separately sold as personal property rather than real property. Now, in a uh, transfer of uh, property, be it uh, real or personal, when is a writing required? <clears throat> New Jersey has something called the Statute of Frauds, which indicates that when you have a contract between parties uh, in writing, you have a legal agreement, and therefore you can enforce that agreement. Generally speaking, with certain exceptions, in real estate, you need a real estate, you need a contract, you need a writing. In personal property, you don't necessarily need a writing, it can pass by just by virtue of what is happening and how it's uh, being handled. Right, so personal property can be transferred through an oral agreement? Yes. What is a, um, an estate sale? An estate sale is when you have assets that was previously owned by someone who has now died. And those assets are now being sold. It could be the real property of the person who uh, has passed away, or it could be any of the personal assets of, those, of that property, that person, uh, which the range could be extremely long and large. It could be someone's wedding ring, it could be a picture, uh, it could be any kind of, uh, of asset that is other than the real property itself. Generally speaking, the, um, the sale occurs after the person passes away. Uh, either it is transferred by someone's will, or it's transferred because we have laws in New Jersey called intestate laws which says who gets the property if you don't make a will, or if there is a specific writing with regard to the transfer of that property, either before or after the person's death. Uh, a couple of other preparatory questions. Uh, what is the meaning of as is in connection with a real estate transaction? In a real estate transaction, as is simply means that the seller is transferring the asset specifically the way it is at a particular point in time. That there's making no representations with regard to it, they're saying nothing about it, and the buyer understands that that particular item may or may not work, may or may not leak as in a roof, may or may not um, be as expected in connection with what the buyer is doing. So uh, generally speaking, as is simply means that it's buyer beware. The buyer takes whatever it is in whatever condition it's in. Now, in the absence of any written or oral agreement with regard to personal property, does the as is in a real estate transaction include the personal property? Generally, it does not. As is, as I said, really deals with the real estate itself. As is doesn't necessarily cause a transfer of the property. Right. Did you review the contract of sale and the uh, deed in this particular case? I did. Was there any transfer of personal property in either of those? No. In fact, a form was used, and the form where it says to be included or excluded was left blank. Now, can the personal property be abandoned? Absolutely. And how does it become abandoned? Well, it's interesting, we have a statute in New Jersey, 46 colon 30C, which deals with how property can be ultimately abandoned. And what it basically says is, it says first it defines what a finder is. And a finder is a person who has possession of this property. And then it deals with the issue of how one can abandon property. And the words that are used, it can be lost, mislaid or forgotten. And if any one of those three happens and someone comes along and finds that property, 
The finder is the keeper of the property. I'm sure as a child you've heard finders, keepers. That's what it is. So in this particular case, if this property that you're asking about was found by someone and it was lost, mislaid, or forgotten, the finder is the owner of that property. And I want you to assume certain facts. Uh, assume that between 1939 and 1965, members of the Abrams family lived at 1602 Fourth Avenue. Uh, initially, um, Lewis and Estelle Abrams. Um, upon his death, it was owned by Estelle. Upon Lewis's death, it was owned by Estelle. Subsequently, by Estelle and Anne, and then sold by Anne Abrams. In 1965, I want you to further assume that Stella Lewis had a son, Herbie. Um, I want you to assume that in uh, years roughly 1933 through 1964, it was uh, against the law to possess 1882 gold certificates. And I want you to further assume that. A safe was discovered in on the premises of 1602 Fourth Avenue, and within the safe were business records of Abrams and Son and 1882 gold certificates, which were secreted in a tin box, which had a false bottom. Uh, were you able to re reach any conclusions as to whether or not this was abandoned property and then sold by home? Yes. I, I, one other additional fact, as I understand it, the fact the safe was not affixed to anything, that it was either on wheels or it was just standing on the ground. It was personal property, is that? Because, because there is something uh, in a real estate contract dealing with fixtures. Uh, fixtures will go along with the, the real estate for safety reasons. For example, uh, if I were to take a stove that was hooked up in the kitchen, uh, as part of the sale as the, as the seller, and I didn't hook up the gas line properly or disconnect the gas line property, that house could potentially blow up. So there are certain things that are deemed fixtures uh, that are normally, because of the safety factor, are going to go along with the property. Um, something that is on wheels, such as that safe, is not a fixture. So the question becomes, when there is a sale of this property, is that property included in the sale or not included in the sale? And if it's silent, then there is, um, there is, there is nothing to indicate where it's to go or who it's to go. It's up in the air. So if you move in and you find something that the seller left, uh, you can assume that the seller left it. But that's all you can do. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted you to, to assume, and that's to assume that uh, the seller and buyers in 2013, you've seen the contract of sale, were unaware of the existence of either the safe or the certificates. Uh, again, my question is, do you have an opinion as to whether this was a bad property? First of all, you've got to have knowledge that something exists. And as I understand this situation and the facts in this matter, um, neither the buyer or the seller at that particular time had knowledge of the existence of these gold certificates or, or what, whatever is in the safe. Um, and under the statute, and based on the facts as I understand in this case, um, the safe was abandoned along with whatever the contents of it was because it was either lost, forgotten, mislaid. There was no specific understanding between any of the parties as to who was going to receive this particular item. And therefore, it was up for grabs. have an opinion based upon the assumptions I ask you to take as to who the prior owner of the property would have been. Who would have abandoned it? 